to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. Oh, I had to pause for a second. It's been a while. <laughs> all right. Your fortnightly podcast for all things guitar and gear. I am Chris. With me tonight, as always, is Jesse. Woohoo! And uh, we're just now coming back from our somewhat extended holiday break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the holidays, they kind of creep up on you. And then all of a sudden, it's like the end of January and we're recording our first show. Well, it's not really the end of January, but uh, it's, it's been true. a while. It's yeah. Been a- Out of practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been practicing guitar, though, I have to say. Uh, well, yes, yeah, sabbatical will do that for you. Yeah, yeah, I know. Sabbatical is time to you know practice maybe a little bit more. Uh, been working on some two five one um, progressions. I can't remember if I was working on that before the break or not. Doesn't matter. Working yeah. on it forever. Two five one. Two five one. So um, pretty common chord progression. If you're not familiar with it, once you've already got the one four five thing down, two five one is kind of a a nice next step, I guess. I'm doing it in seventh, so it's a minor seventh, and then and for the for the two, and it's a uh, dominant seven for the five, and then a major seven for the one chord. So and all that jazz, and all that jazz, yes. <laughs> and along with that, you know, I'm playing some songs with two five one progressions, like Satin Doll, which is more two five, but you get the idea. Um, there and just sort of uh, experimenting with new chords and lighter voicings. I'm doing sort of three finger voicings of the seventh chords. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, some I like, some not so much, but I'm looking forward to seeing where we're going with my instructor um, in these chord voicings and whatnot. Right. So, Wonderful. Yeah, it's it's been good stuff. I'm working on a few other things too. We can talk all about that later though. We'll let you go ahead and have at it and what you've been working on. Cool. Um, we've just kind of uh, playing around and revisiting uh, various things, not with any kind of great, you know, import or drive. <laughs> just kind of. So that backing track, um, that Hal Leonard backing track uh, thing that we were jamming on over the weekend. Um, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, uh, so I like how they have uh, sort of like jazz uh, sort of standards um, they for whatever reason they can't. Oh yeah, for those on video, he's got the big book of backing tracks and everything. <laughs> so it's um, and they have songs that are like a takeoff on like autumn leaves. I forget what the name of it is, like falling trees or something Fall like branches that. Branches or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like it's autumn leaves, you know. And uh, but they have some pretty cool uh, backing tracks in a couple different keys, which is nice, you know. So you get to uh, do your changes over those, and they're not. Those are nice because the ones that they have, I think Misty is one of them. They call it Foggy. And and it's uh, nice because they're not the tunes that are uh, really hard. You know, It's not like hard bop where the key is changing every other bar. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's nice to play over, you know? Yeah. One of the things I want to do with this book, I haven't gotten around to it quite yet, is to go through some of these interesting um, backing tracks and understand the chord changes a little bit and just practice mm-hmm. the chord changes. Yeah. So just practice the rhythm. As opposed sure. to worrying, because a lot of times the backing tracks, you know, the, the, the gut instinct is let's solo over this. Right. Right. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of value to be had by just going ahead and saying, all right, let's play the rhythm part yeah. and play the chords, get the chord changes under your fingers. Because some of these, you know, are quite interesting. They've got like a verification, uh, which is a jazz bebop progression in A has mm-hmm. a, for example, a C sharp minor seven, uh, seven flat five. Mm-hmm. For half half a bar, and the other half a bar is a F sharp seven. So yeah. that's kind of you know interesting, and and this is kind of what I just randomly opened up to. But I think it's definitely worthwhile um, just working on the rhythm, you know, yeah. for a while, and kind of opening up my mind to what are some other chord changes progressions out there that people play in a variety of styles. Because you know you mentioned jazz. There's there's country. There's fusion. There's a Dorian jam in F minor. I'm kind of just flipping through at this point, kind of randomly. And then, of course, it starts with your real basic 12-bar blues stuff, 8-bar blues. Right. Um, good stuff. Uh, yeah, I had a good time when we jammed over it. I uh, definitely would recommend uh, the book to uh, anyone looking for backing tracks in there that are just kind of tired of 
YouTube. <laughs> well, YouTube has a um, – and maybe it's just that I haven't looked very deeply or whatever, but it definitely seems to have a lot more of the simpler stuff, whether it be um, the blues-based or even like the sort of rock ballad with the ethereal maybe keyboard pad in the back or whatever – the idea being you can crank up the gain and have that singing sort of Satriani sustain. But but the idea is still that it, it doesn't really – the changes aren't that complicated. Right. On well, most of them. You know, yeah. There's a few. Yeah. And the ones that are complicated or even or the ones that aren't complicated, you don't often – we don't always have documentary for them. That's true. So yeah, if you're a true. beginner, you might – or you have a bad ear like me, you know, you might not know, you know, well, what, what chords are in this? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, what are the changes, these kinds of things. So, and also I find with YouTube, um, and I don't get me wrong. I use YouTube all the time. I love YouTube for oh, stuff, yeah. but I find that, you know, if I do a search like guitar backing track, I've gotten to the point where I've done a lot of these now, I have to really scroll down to find one I haven't done. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So I mean, I probably need to vary my, um, Search parameters a little bit, maybe guitar backing track in A or <laughs> guitar backing track. I haven't done yet. <laughs> I haven't done yet. Oh boy, that, that's scary. That probably does work actually. <laughs> so yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's a, a good, it's a good resource um, uh, for to check out. So uh, anything else you'd like to talk about that you've been working on or? Uh, not as far as practicing goes, um, yeah. just, you know, playing some acoustic and, and some more ELO tunes and just kind of, it's neat because you get a bug in your head and but the internet is such a wonderful thing. Cause now it's kind of like, Oh, I remember that song from my heyday or whatever the deal was. And then you right. can just search it and the tabs out there, or at least the chords are out there and it's just so cool. But anyway, yeah. um, the other stuff I've been I've been doing is kind of uh, reading through some guitar electronics to get my head wrapped around some of the more complicated switching arrangements. Mm. And I don't know if we want to do this at a different part of the show, but um, try to figure out what I'm going to do with a couple of my guitars. Well, hey, you know what? Let's um, why don't we go ahead and talk about that a little bit because I've had some electronics that we've done. Yes, we have. You've got some electronics you're planning on, so. Um, one of the things that I got for Christmas this year for my wonderful wife was a set of uh, pure vintage 1954 Fender pickups. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they did not have a home to go into because of the difficulty I had getting the pick guard off my Strat, the one you see behind me. So I had to go out and buy another Strat. <laughs> not, not exactly unfortunate. Well, yeah, what else are you going to do, right? <laughs> like, go, go buy a Strat. So I bought a, um, a made in Mexico a black Strat. And uh, we put those in so we can talk about that process. And then you, I know, have been planning on some several, some interesting uh, rewirings as well. Yeah. So let's, well, let's go about the, with the Strat first. Sure. And this was a really nice score on your, on your part. Um, yeah. It's a used guitar from uh, our local guitar shop, k and Music. Uh, actually, no. Oh, no? No, it was from a music go-round. Oh, was it really? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I mistook that. I, I, I thought it came from k and S. No, yeah, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Um, oh, my, has my this, It, it kind of reminds me, you know the Play It Again Sports they used yeah. to be, have, right? That you would do these, these used stores, used like sports equipment stores. Right. It was kind of like that, but nicer. Uh-huh. And it had lots of guitars in there. The vast majority of the guitars were like your Squires. Right. Right. Or other sort of like unfamiliar to me brands, but they had other things as well. And basically they just sell used gear. Sure. And um, there was this uh, made in Mexico Strat hanging up on the uh, top shelf that uh, I pulled down and played it. I was like, wow, this plays really nice. But I was getting no sound out of the neck pickup. Mm -hmm. And so I put it back. I was like, oh boy, there's a lot of uncertainties here. And I played a whole bunch of different stuff. And I just kept wanting to go back to that um, that strat. And there was an Epiphone strat that I liked, but it had a chunk out of the headstock, and uh, there was a crack in the finish. I was a little worried about that one. Plus, Epiphone, you don't know if you got an extra uh, neck, an aftermarket neck, if it would fit right or anything. Exactly, because I really wanted this as a project guitar, and I was concerned about would I be able to get this neck. So, uh, but I loved the neck on that Epiphone. If it wasn't for the crack in that headstock, I probably would have walked away with it. Yeah. But that being said, I took the. Uh, MIM strat back to the counter and uh, I said hey um, this doesn't work the neck pickup doesn't work and so they they popped up off the pit guard did a little bit of soldering and just realized there was some bad soldering done 
Mm-hmm. And after <laughs> we put it back together, played nicely. So ended up getting it. And uh, that's the new home for these 1954 pure vintage Fender pickups, which definitely changed the sound of that Stratocaster. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. In, in the, the Mexican Strat, there was basically the ceramic pickups and uh, the ceramic magnets, I guess is what they're called, right? They're, um, yeah. yeah. So play, they were okay. They were fine. They're, they're, they weren't bad. But when we put the 54s in, it was like, wow this is a nice sounding guitar now, like really nice sounding guitar. Yeah. It just doesn't, uh, those kind of pickups. Um, so, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, they're basically like just metal, like steel slugs, um, as pole pieces. And then beneath the pickup, there's two ceramic magnets, which is totally different than a Strat, which has a, uh, just Alnico, um, you know, poles built into the pickup. And it just, for some reason, it gives you a different sound. It's, it doesn't have that like really clear chimey kind of strat sound. So yeah, definitely a good score on those pickups. Yeah. But it does now. I mean, the, uh, it does does have that. I have to say though, you know, reading online, it seems like the late fifties pickups and the sixties pickups models tend to be more popular, at least Uh with people informed. But, and I think that's because they're higher output. These are not particularly high output pickups. I wouldn't try Metallica with these pickups. Um, no. Right. But if you want that classic Strat sound. It'll it's definitely do Mark Knopfler. No doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. The 57s. And you can look, you know, if you search online for um, the windings and, and uh, the resistance was how, you, how you'd measure the windings. The 57s definitely were not as hot as the later, like the 62s or even later. Um not that those were even hot. I mean, like these are all kind of vintage strat right, you know, sounds. Right. But yeah, nothing like a modern pickup tends to be. But you know, the the one important thing that we learned through the process of um, taking apart the strat is that folks at home, if you haven't already done so, and it's not too late, take the plastic off of the pick <laughs> yes, guard. That's right. I forgot about so, that. Yeah. So the story is, you know, we, we looked at this guitar and there was some the pick guard looked like it was peeling and I was hesitant to get to the store until I looked closer and both I and the sales associate said, you know what? That's the original coating. So this is a 2003, two, uh, so 2004 um, Strat that someone never bothered to take the pick guard plastic off the front or the back, the back plate cover. It doesn't have, it has it on air as well. So I was like, okay, this is awesome. This is going to be like getting a brand new pick guard because it's been protected for all of these years. And right. the way the condition of the guitar is in, I, 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 I believe that someone bought this for like their child or their grandchild and it stayed under somebody's bed for about a decade. That's what it looked like. You know, so um, because it was so clean. I mean, there wasn't like, you know, fruit no fruit or whatever candy, you know, dug into the fretboard from like some kid yeah. not washing their hands playing. And no fret- fretware, no scratches. No fretware, nothing. So um, anyway, Jesse and I start pulling off this, this plastic and we notice it's really dull underneath. Really dull, bad. And it was hard to get that plastic off. Too. It was a challenge. It wasn't so coming. This is off. just the the plastic that you get. Like anytime you get something new with with plastic on it, you yeah. know, whether it's electronics or guitar parts, with you know, and and um, so it's just that protective thing you're supposed to take off as soon as you get it in your home. But yeah, so, they left it on. Yeah, for over a decade, and uh, boy, it was a very dull pickguard. <laughs> it was like we were almost peeling off the luster of the pickguard. Yeah. And um, fortunately, I had another pick guard um, with me. We were able to swap them out, and it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, cost us a little bit of time to take all the electronics out and everything. But, you know, ultimately, people just take the plastic off. Yeah, trust get us. That, get that off of there. <laughs> yeah. You think you might be thinking, oh, well, you know, this is like protecting this nice pick guard. No, just take it off. You, you just take it off. Yeah. And I don't even. I haven't even tried, nor will I try to take the, the plastic off the back plate cover because I'm just really afraid of what I'll find underneath. Yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah. Just leave it on. You know, it doesn't show anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, those are uh, my – you're in my adventures anyway into guitar rewiring and uh, messing around. So let's talk a little bit about yours or your planned adventures. Yeah, so I haven't uh, – so I ordered a new pick guard, uh, new pickup. So what I'm doing is um, swapping uh, a couple of pickups in my uh, one-quart uh, M800 
And they have Mighty Might pickups in them, which are pretty well respected. They're chrome covered, you know, standard sort of PAF ish, you know, um, humbuckers. This is in a hollow body guitar. But I wanted something different, you know, and I wanted to get some more um, combinations, you know, for splitting and, you know, uh, with the pickups. So what I did was I'm looking, my whole thing is I like single coil sounds as well in a guitar. It's, but the classic problem has been that it's hard to get a good single coil sound out of a humbucker that you split. So you split a humbucker, meaning you use one coil of it, but that pickups are designed to sound good all together with both coils going. And when you split to just one coil, it tends to be a bit weak because they're not really wound as hot as even a regular classic Strat uh, pickup. It's not designed to be used that way. Um, but you can get some pickups that, uh, as humbuckers, that when you split them, they're better. They tend to be the hotter ones. So if you get a Duncan JB or some sort of distortion or super distortion pickup, they tend to split better because they're naturally hotter anyway. Mm -hmm. Um now, I had had a custom-made one from years ago, and, and I wanted another one like this um, that's sort of designed to split. And what this guy has done, and his uh, he's called uh, Cat Whisker Pickups in the UK, and um, he has a, a pickup called the S-Bucker. And the idea is, uh, first, you take um, one side of a humbucker and you replace the screws with um, actual pole pieces that are Alnico magnets, like a Strat uh, pickup would be. And... Um, so actually, I have a pickup right here. I can show you. Those of you on video can see this is a cross section of a humbucker pickup. And so you see two coils. And then below the coils, you see a magnet between them. That's that dark gray piece. And then there's these steel bars that uh, the screws from the humbucker go into. And that one magnet magnetizes both sides of the humbucker. What you can do is take out one row of those screws, put in Alnico pole pieces, and then... Um, Instead of having one magnet between the two, you just use a smaller magnet um, to energize the screws on the other side. A few people have done something like that. This guy actually takes one of those uh, coils, the one that you're going to split to, and winds it hotter and it's taller and it has an extra little coil so that when you split it, it's not a half a humbucker. It actually has the full windings that a, a Strat coil would be. And I've never heard of this being done quite that way. And uh, so I said, hey, Wind me up one, <laughs> you know, and he's a reasonable price too. It's uh, 60 pounds, which is pretty cheap for a custom wound pickup. And I looked and he had some good reviews and everything. So I uh, ordered one and it has shipped. So I'm expecting that in about a week. Cool. And I will put that in my guitar. And so right now what I'm doing is going through like all the uh, SeymourDuncan.com um, has a lot of like kind of wiring 101, you know, <laughs> articles on – how guitar pickups are wound, how the electronics work, all the switching capability and everything. And so I'm sort of revisiting all that to figure out how exactly I want to wire this bad boy. Uh, but I'm getting excited. It's going to be cool. Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like a great project. it will be really cool to hear it. And uh, we'll definitely have to play it on the show so everybody can hear uh, how the, uh, the pickup, the new pickup sounds. If you're sort of in this sort of mindset of, hey, you know, I'm kind of interested in um, – maybe changing pickups on my guitar, but it kind of seems to be a little scary. Um, it's not bad. It really, I'm not, I'm not a person who has much of a, a experience in electronics at all. And um, really the hardest part is, um, was well, the soldering. Yeah. And, and, you know, and if you, if you want to be, get serious about it, you can get soldering cha training kits. You don't need to go mm -hmm. that deep into it. Um, you could also just practice on one of your guitars that, you know, you're, you're working on. Uh, there's some great YouTube videos on how to solder, and uh, that's really the hardest part. The wiring diagrams, especially for something like a Strat, tends right. to be pretty – if you're only doing pickups, you're not worried about sort of soldering or putting in a new uh, tone pot or volume pot or switch or anything like that. It's really not bad. You basically just look at um, – use a little bit of common sense uh, before you start – desoldering anything look at the connections you know where does the where do the wires from the pickup go do you know what what part of the switch does it go to and then where does it go to ground it almost always grounds on, a, on, the, on one of the pots yep right so um yeah if you just look at it and you take a picture or tape it right right down um where things go and then just when you desolder things you put them back in do it one at a time and you can just Heck, if you're really worried about it, what you could do is um, just desolder one pickup coil at a time. 
Yeah, that's true. And then put, you know, take out the neck, put the neck, the new neck in, and you only have one open slot on your switch. You know exactly where it goes. Uh, I know when we did my strat, we were, this was totally my fault. I didn't pay attention <laughs> and I ended up um, wiring them backwards. And so I put the, um, the bridge connected to the, or the, the neck pickup connected to the bridge um, switch and, you know, the way around. And we became pretty apparent once we started testing the uh, <laughs> guitar right. out and like, oh, wait a minute, this is not right. So, um, that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's actually no matter what the design of the switch is, whether it's a like a push pull on a, on a pot or the blade switch that you had, it, it's kind of counterintuitive because you solder to the one end of the switch. But because it sort of goes 180 degrees off, it's actually the other position. It's right. kind of across from it. Yeah. Right. And I just wasn't thinking when I was doing it. I was like, ah, oh, you know, crap. What are you going to do? So well, what we did is we desoldered it and just, you know, put it back the yeah. way it should. And you really – you really aren't going to screw it up unless you start bending components. Right. And so you don't want to bend the leads on the switch or anything like that, and, but you shouldn't be doing anything that would lead to that. You know, if, if, if you're, if you're desoldering a wire, uh, it shouldn't take much force at all to remove the wire out of the um, connection. Right. And if you have to really yank on it enough to potentially bend the lead, then you don't have it desoldered properly. Right. Uh, or they might have wrapped the wire around the lead and then you can use needle nose pliers or whatever to try to try to undo that. So if you take your time, use a little bit of common sense, swapping out pickups is not really all that big of a deal. That's true. And you're right in that you can't really screw too much up in terms of the electronics. And I mean, there's enough lead where you're usually not going to fry as long as you're careful and you're not you know, digging into the pickups or anything. It's like right. you shouldn't really hurt the pickups themselves. The rest of the stuff is pretty cheap. I mean, pots and switches and whatnot, even if you – worst to worst, you screwed something up. It's like, you know, you can get that stuff easily. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I would say is – here's a couple tips, OK? Jesse's top three tips, you know, <laughs> for a successful guitar rewiring. Um, you know, prep is everything. <laughs> yes. It really – you know, have a good – space that, get, that you have a plenty of space and you have good airflow we had uh, we worked in your lab so we had a nice uh, am i allowed to say that yeah sure <laughs> and yeah, sure. so we had the hood you know that would would suck the air but i mean even if you just have like a little six inch desk fan or something so that you don't you, you're not sucking up the soldering fumes that's not healthy <laughs> or the plastic coating on some of the wires because if right. you're soldering if you're not careful and you touch that soldering iron into the plastic then you don't want to be breathing that stuff in either that's true so have plenty of space have nice airflow around you um and uh and take your time you know have a good make it nice and clean um have all your parts laid out in a place, you know, uh, little dishes or whatever you're going to do for screws and little parts. You're not kicking them onto the floor and then you're frustrated. Um, the other thing is the one thing that that you will rue, <laughs> and this is what's nice about a Strat, is, is they have a pick guard. that. And I'm not a fan of the pick guard. I like, you know, a nice clean face with just pickup rings or even direct mounted. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's really nice about a pick guard is all your work is on the back of this piece of plastic. You're not going to hurt anything. Right. Um, whereas I can't say I've done this, but I've almost done this. <laughs> it's hard if you're working around a guitar. I mean, if you can desolder everything from like the output jack, you know, mark down how that's wired up and then just get it all away from the guitar, you know, so that you're not dropping your soldering gun or hot solder splatter or whatever onto your nice Les Paul or Gretsch, whatever it is you have. Right. <laughs> Cause that's right. what will make you hate yourself in the morning. <laughs> yes. Um, and if you can't do that for whatever reason, you know, have towels and and really cover anything that you could damage. Because, I mean, you could drop things on the face of your guitar or <laughs> whatever, and that's a bad thing. Sure. So uh, – and take your time, you know. I mean, everything can be uh, can be done and, and, you know, it's it's all awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's going to take time for the soldering iron to warm up. It's going to take oh. time – to warm up the metal because when you solder, you, you touch the soldering iron to the metal, not to the solder. And yeah. so when you're desoldering the grounds, the grounds of the pickups go to the um, pot and on the back of the pot. And it takes a while to heat that up. It really does. Uh, so a lot of metal there. With that in mind, um, you know, electronics, a lot of times they say use a, um, a lower wattage uh, iron. But I would stay away from like the little 15 watt irons. I mean, you should be looking at something like a 30 watt or even a 40 watt because then when you have to 
um, melt that big chunk of solder on the back of a pot, <laughs> you know, it'll do it. Yeah. Um, the 15 watts probably won't even. So, um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've never actually soldered humbucker uh, pickups in a humbucker guitar. Now I've done the, with you, I did the bridge humbucking, uh, Pacifica that I have. It right. has a strat with a, uh, humbucker, but it's been so long ago. I don't really remember a whole lot of it. Um, uh, I think if I'm would change pickups in, uh, one of my humbucking guitars, it'd probably be my SG. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I've never done that before. I don't know if it's easier or more difficult than the Strat. The Strat does seem very convenient in that it all comes off with that pick guard. Yeah. Uh, I know that with the humbucking guitars, my Les Paul, I'm sure there's some threading that needs to be done of wires down to the uh, where the controls are. Um so it might be a bit more of a challenge. I would say maybe recommend people to start with the Strat kind of thing if you're going to, for your first time, swap out pickups. That's a good point. Yeah, because you have to, um, you know, if you're going to swap out a, a pickup in an SG, I mean, you have to unsolder the one pickup and then thread it through and then thread the new cable through because there's a, a kind of a channel that will go through the guitar, right? you know, behind the pickup ring. Yeah, and that's one of the things that kind of makes it hard um, with those kind of guitars, the rear routed ones, because I guess you kind of have to work around your guitar itself. <laughs> yeah, there's not much you can do uh, otherwise. And so um, if you might be wondering, too, like if you looked at the back of your guitar, you might say, you know, if you have like a Les Paul or an SG or one of those kinds of body types, you might see like a black piece of plastic on the back. Like, wonder what that is. You, you don't have trim strings or whatever, springs or whatever. And that's access your, your pots. Right. So, mm-hmm. so you can do these kinds of things like put in new pickups or whatever. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, you said preparation is key. I would say the first thing you should do is watch a couple of videos on YouTube of somebody actually doing whatever it is you want to do. That's a good point. And you can say, you know, how to change pickups in a Les Paul style guitar or how to change pickups in a Strat or God forbid you do something like my 339 where you have to work through the death holes. <laughs> All right. right. Those, if I ever design, ever decide that that guitar needs new pickups, it's going straight to a luthier. I am not doing that one. Well, you know what you do with that? I think I haven't uh, replaced the stuff yet in mine, but um, it actually may be easier than something like an SG or a Paul because now let me think about that. No, I'm fibbing to you because with a semi hollow body, you have the same difficulties. I'm thinking of my court, which is a full hollow body, where if I desolder at the uh, output jack, I can pull all the pots and everything through the pickup rings, you know, because once you pull the pickups, you have an open shot to the inside of this guitar. It's almost like an acoustic. It's just open. Right. That's the um, point. And all the electronics come out. So then I can just work on the electronics, get them all together. Then the problem is getting it down there and thread it up through the, the holes where the pots have – the shafts have to come up. Yeah. Um, but at least until that point, it's much easier. But yeah, I guess with the 339, you've got kind of the worst of all worlds. Yeah. It was, so I think – yeah, I think it's just <laughs> they stay, whatever they are. And I like the pickups just fine anyway. Um, but true. yeah, if I ever needed to change them out, it would definitely be going to a luthier. Um, yeah. Because it's just something I think it would be too easy for me to screw up. Yeah, you make a good point about watching a YouTube video, not just um, in in how you can see that it's done and get a feel for how fast stuff should melt and how you know how long you should hold wires in place, but also here's all the stuff you're going to need. And you see that whoever it is doing the stuff with, uh, okay, here's my desoldering braid or or sucker or whatever it is, my iron, my sponge, my you know solder, all that stuff. Yep. And those are all good things to to know and have a checklist for. And it's just one of those things where, you know, if you're a beginning guitar player, you're probably thinking, oh, my God, there's no way I would ever, ever try something like that. <laughs> yeah, I was well. there myself, you know. <laughs> and what happens is you, you get your next guitar and you're like, I've got this old guitar laying around. I wonder what I can do to it. And what pops up is you have a friend like Jesse who says, well, we can put new pickups in there. And you're like, <laughs> you don't say. That's possible. And Jesse's like, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. And so here's his guitar fetish.com And look at all of these wonderful pickups you can buy. And then all of a sudden you find yourself with a guitar in pieces laying in front of you. And there you are <laughs> soldering uh, and putting new pickups in. It's just, it's part of this hobby of uh, playing guitar that, uh, that I think it, I don't want to say it's inevitable to go down that route, but uh, boy. And you know, it really depends on the person. I've known yeah. people that are guitar players that just, they don't even care. It's like, no, I have whatever it is, you know, whether it's a, 
you know, a Les Paul or a Strat or a Kramer or whatever it was. Um, and I just like the guitar. I like the sound of it. I have no need to play with it. Mm-hmm. And there's just no desire at all. And, and actually, I kind of uh, envy those people <laughs> because they're the people that spend their time at home writing songs, recording music, you know, getting yeah, stuff yeah. done. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've got like three guitars and parts and pieces, <laughs> not in any kind of functional you know, situation. But, yep. you know, it's it's not so much about just playing guitar, but uh, about guitaring. <laughs> yes. And that is, um, boy, that is a, a, a hole. That's a deep hole that you, once you go from playing guitar to guitaring, as you just said, it you all of a sudden you end up with 11 of them and then you know you're putting pickups in them or like you're thinking gee i could probably swap necks or you know whatever the case may be so retubing my amps you know right yeah (laughs) what circuit can i put in here (laughs) yeah i'm I'm a ways from that that's for sure um and i don't think the bass breaker i have is the best of all sort of amp for that (laughs) anyway uh i could be wrong i could be wrong but um well, uh, let's see. Did you have any birthdays or events? I have two. Oh, excellent. I have Jimmy Page, January 9th, 1944. Ooh, happy birthday, so, Jimmy. Happy birthday, Jimmy. And Joe Pass, my favorite uh, chord melody jazzer, uh, January 13th, 1929. All right. Happy birthday, Joe, 1929. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so he uh, – oh, now I, I don't remember when he passed away. I think 94 or something like that. It's been a while. OK. But yeah. So yeah, I was just watching a, a – one nice thing about some of these things, he, he's got a lot of uh, videos out there on YouTube that, uh, that are cool. Yeah. You know, some old stuff. He's Ella Fitzgerald or just solo or whatever. He's just an unassuming guy who happens to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so Excellent. And it's always great when they're unassuming and awesome as opposed to assuming and awesome. That's, That's true. Personalities sometimes get in the way. Well, uh, let's see here. I think we have uh, run our course uh, for the evening. Do you agree? Indeed. Welcome right. back, everybody. Yes, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around. Um, just a quick note. We do have two videos reviewing the Bass Breaker 007, the Fender, the newest newish Fender amp. So if you're interested, check out. They're on YouTube. I don't think we have audio only on those. I think they're all video. And so we've got two videos. One, a real quick re, um, sort of review kind of thing. And then the other one is a bit more in-depth where um, Jesse and I play through a bunch of different types of guitars just to get a sense of uh, the amp. So please go check it out. If you like the video, click like. Um, if you like what you heard tonight or today, whenever you're listening to our, our podcast, uh, please uh, subscribe, click like, leave us an iTunes review. That really helps us out a lot in terms of getting word out there about the show we'd love to get feedback you can email me chris at jestercat.com or you can tweet us at sst show and uh i think that covers it all for tonight folks so just keep picking and grinning six strings and things a guitar adventure is a production of jester cat studios you can see more about this show and all other jester cat shows at jestercat.com you can also email the show at sixstringsandthings at gmail.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can also follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester700, and Chris at CW Cult. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 